this image that was cast around cannabis, reefer madness, all these things, this only started in 1930. Before that, cannabis was a part of over 80% of the world's medicines at that time. It was utilized heavily. And so I think this is what's really happening when we look at like the destigmatization of cannabis. The challenge is no one is getting a user manual for cannabis. And if they are, it's like, here's what THC means. Here's CBD. Here's what an edible is and here's how you smoke or vape. It's like very quantitative left brain looking, but there's not really a lot about like the spiritual side of cannabis. Welcome back to the medicine podcast. My name is Mimi and I have my lovely, glorious, manly partner in life and love and podcasting and exploring the medicines, the real medicines of this earth. Chase. And we're doing that today, baby. I'm so lit up. I've got Ryan Sprague energy just flowing through my veins <laughs> just from four minutes of talking to him before we hit record. Yeah. Ryan Sprague, the cannabis professional. Welcome back to the Medicine Podcast, my friend. Oh, uh, thank you so much, Chase Mimi. It's amazing to be here with both of you. And it's so much fun. You know, we charge each other's batteries. We were talking about it beforehand. You know, battery charging is something that is it holds a near and dear place to my heart because it's my it's my compass it's my north star in life you know it allows me to know how i always want to show up and be received but it also shows me what people places and things are right for me and you guys are nail on the head so thank you for having me we, back on <laughs> we are so excited to have you back on this is ryan's second appearance on the medicine podcast your first episode that we did i think was episode 131 and mm -hmm. um that was a really great intro uh for you know your personal story and your background and what led you to this work and then we also get into like just cannabis 101 yep. and so we wanted to go deeper with this with this episode covering sort of the basics on the last episode we really wanted to go deep with you which i know you're up for um, yes. So we'll just get right into it. The first question that you may or may not remember from last time that we ask every guest, <laughs> what do you love in your life? What aspect of your life do you love so much that you wish you could gift it to every human? Oh, joy. <clears throat> joy is the number one thing for me. It is like the thing that allows me to truly enjoy life. I mean, joy is literally a part of enjoy. Um, but that is the ultimate thing for me. You know, that is the thing that in all the work I do, you know, and we'll talk more about this, how like the vehicle I might teach is conscious cannabis, but the point of that goes much deeper and it's to tap into this state of joy that is our innate state of being as human beings. And when we start taking all the masks off that have covered that up, that's naturally what comes forth. And so, you know, I've heard it mentioned that happiness is ghetto joy, right? Where it's fleeting, right? And so like the end of the day, like I want people to be able to tap into that state of joy all the time. And it's like this, right? Like, you know, someone might be able to actually take what I'm about to say and make it practical, right? And I like to leave things in practicality. So imagine if you are just starting to go to the gym, right? And at first, it's very challenging, right? You can't find much joy there. But then fast forward five years later, how much joy do you have in discomfort, right? So people might say, well, how could I have joy if I'm going through a romantic challenge or a business challenge, right? And it's very similar. It's not something that just happens, right? It's an acquired built muscle over time. And so that's the thing that I'm really training people in is how to access joy as they take those masks off with the vehicle that is conscious cannabis. Mm, oh, that's so that. good. And and mm. this joy is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Like this is very, very relevant for me because this combination of joy with purpose slash vision or, a, mm. or kind of this arcing dream of your existence is the sweet spot. I mean, that's the combo. And how much of at least my life has been spent with purpose and vision and fervor, but but a lack of joy and play and freedom to be spon you know, spontaneity and and some of these other more uh out of the box ways of thinking because I get so attached to a purpose and don't leave room for joy. And um very, very relevant, such a crucial ingredient. And that the ingredient that pushes you through that challenge on your purpose such that you can continue to yeah. have energy. Yeah. It's a, the labor of love, as as Paul Check says all the time. I know we're all familiar with that. Like, if it's not a labor of love, it's not a labor worth doing. And that's the only thing that our love for the thing, our joy in the thing, in the process is going to be the thing, the fuel that keeps yeah. us moving, even through the difficult aspects, like you said. 
100%. You know, I think joy for me, it's very similar to the battery charger thing, right? It's a sign for me of like, oh, wow, like this is me moving in the correct direction. And it's not necessarily in what I do, right? Like, you know, I think a lot of people might read that immediately as like, oh, like, so if I'm not liking something, that means that it's not the right thing for me. And it's not necessarily right. It's like, you know, can I find joy in being alive? And can I then apply that joy to what I'm doing and allow what I'm doing to give me more joy and kind of have this positive energetic loop of reciprocity between, you know, who I am and who I be as an infinite being, you know, a divine being, a soul or a spirit having a human experience. And then can I find joy in this illusion of separation that oftentimes can be riddled with guilt, shame, et cetera, before we start really uncovering those masks that are covering it up? Yeah, yeah, it's so true. Oh, we could yeah. go so hard. On yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> but, but maybe Ryan, you know, we like we mentioned, we went into your your personal backstory in the last episode. But maybe let's you know, it's been a little over a year since we last chatted on the podcast. What mm. have you been up to? Uh, maybe maybe update everybody on your you know cannabis professional uh, mm. identity and some of the things that you've been doing the last year or two in the world of cannabis. Definitely. I would love to dive into this. So really what we've been doing is, like I talked about before, like the vehicle that we teach people how to dive into the subconscious, how to take those masks off, et cetera, is conscious cannabis. And the way in which we've been doing that up until recently has been through separate uh, main quests, if you will, right? I'm an RPG player, or at least used to be a lot when I'm in my teenage years. So I always refer to it as main and side quests. And so we had these different main quests, right? We had connect with cannabis that was designed to help you create a healthy relationship with cannabis and unlock the psychedelic powers of the plant to be a tool for self-awareness in your life, right? So we had that main quest. And that was also kind of a two-part program. It was also certifying people to go out and be an educator, guide, facilitator, coach, et cetera, within the realm of cannabis. And then we had grow with cannabis, right? Which was all about how to cultivate your own medicine at home, how to save 70% plus on your monthly cannabis expenses. And also like on a deeper layer, learn how to work with the soil and learn how to work with the earth because i truly feel that i would be doing my own self and also the world a disservice if i was just teaching people a skill to grow cannabis right like i wanted to teach them essentially like a buffet right like yeah you can grow cannabis with this but you also in learning to do that just learned how to cultivate all of your own food at the same time mm. with regenerative methods things that when you do when you do them are going to leave the garden of earth greener than when you found it. And so we had these two different main quests. And what I was finding is that in a, again, a deeper layer, when students were going through, they were having these huge breakthroughs. And yet at the same time, what I really saw as the bedrock was the community we were creating, because like I said, the vehicle is conscious cannabis, but really what we're diving into is what's coming out as a result of connecting with cannabis in the way we teach. And so a lot of times what people were saying is that, we're lacking connection, you know, we're lacking like the ability to have other like minded individuals around us. And the thing is, if someone is interested in the topic of conscious cannabis, they're pro it's probably not their start point in the world of self development or spirituality, right? That's not usually what people start with. So, you know, at the end of the day, all of our students are interested in so many different things, gene keys, human design, astrology, spirituality, uh, Kabbalah, all these different things. And so we wanted to create this hub where, yes, we can teach you everything about conscious cannabis, but we can also hold space for all of the other stuff as well. Mm -hmm. And so in hearing our feedback from our clients and working closely with them, we are now launching the Conscious Cannabis Collective, which I'm sure we can get into as well. But that's Really what I've been doing over the past, you know, year and a half is just creating a crap ton of different <laughs> info and courses and things like that designed to help people become empowered, you know, like that's why we're doing this. And, you know, I think a lot of people, especially when they hear cannabis, as opposed to like psilocybin or ketamine or MDMA, which are kind of like the big three in the world of yeah. psychedelics right now, they'd ask me like, well, why are you doing this? Right. Why cannabis? Well, cannabis is the most practical medicine for the actual world we live in. And I'll explain what I mean. So most people, right, like psilocybin, ketamine, and MDMA, although we all understand their benefits, they're still very new to the world of like the typical world, right? Like we live in a bubble, of course, we're understanding these things and things like that. But if we truly want to create a shift and we truly want people to be able to, you know, clear their trauma, resolve their trauma, be able to connect with people, things like that. Well, most people can't afford to spend $5,000 to go down to the jungle and sit with ayahuasca, even though ayahuasca is amazing, right? They can't do that. Also, we're in a recession right now. 
People have families, they have obligations, they can't necessarily take time out of their life. And they also can't take a lot of time to integrate these gigantic experiences, right? Yeah. And so when you're looking at all of these things, and you're also looking at the fact that cannabis can be grown in your backyard <laughs> for very little money, you can supply yourself, you can make all these different medicines, you can create an intoxicating effect, or you could go without that, right? You can juice the pure leaves and just get the THCA. So for someone looking to benefit without having intoxication or out have, without having a psychedelic experience, once again, cannabis is practical. And the other thing too is that you know, when you're looking into cannabis, like as opposed to these other medicines where, yes, you might need a guide, MDMA, obviously you could probably do in your own, but, you know, with ketamine, psilocybin, these are things that if someone is just getting into, they're going to want someone around them to help them, right? Whereas again, like, although in a perfect world, I'd love to be able to say everyone could afford to have a guide and all these things, they just really can't. And cannabis is very easy to work with once you understand the basics. And so like what we really drill home in all of our programs are the basic frameworks from which you can build a skyscraper upon, right? Being able to take three-day breaks, being able to connect with the plan intentionally, being able to have a ceremonial structure that is relevant and resonant with your intention, and then being able to integrate like a pro, right? So you can really connect with this plant as a tool for self-awareness, right? Because, you know, I think talking about these masks as well, like, you know, there's kind of like a five-stage process one goes through when they are moving through transformation, right? And Jeremy's very similar on this. You know, it, it goes from self-awareness to radical honesty with self, then radical honesty with others, and then self-acceptance, and then acceptance of the world around you, right? Seeing like your shadow and everyone understanding that you are everything in an illusion of separation and that even though someone else is portraying an angry mood or something, you can see that part of you and empathize, still create clear boundaries and not get walked all over, but that you can do that. And so cannabis is very easy to be or simple, rather, I will say simple, very simple to be able to go through that process. Now, the reason I say simple, not easy is because simplicity does not equate to being easy, right? Like a lot of this work can be challenged, you know, like you're yeah. coming up against programs, patterns, masks, etc. Yep. And that's why having this year long container, where people can continue to integrate has just helped a lot. Because what happened a lot in connect with cannabis is that people would hop into the program, they do the first ceremony, and they'd get blasted, like they'd have so much awareness that they wouldn't really be ready to jump back into the medicine a week later, right? But the way the program was laid out is that like, if you really wanted to get the best bang in the program, there was a weekly ceremony, right? And weekly calls. So now, in the collective, if someone wants to dive into the first ceremony and they have that experience, they could take a month off if they want. Integrate, they have my support, they have all these different calls they can hop on that aren't necessarily just to talk about ceremonies. And they can really have time and space from which to make sure that they're connecting with the medicine responsibly and intentionally. I think you are on the cutting edge of what is an absolute need and what is an absolute white space as it pertains to plant medicine. I'm just going to use that loosely mm -hmm. um, because in this world of fringe you know, spirituality and self-development and you're leaning into some of these really powerful modalities, it's quite easy to even unconsciously become a facilitator into a salesman who's got this portfolio of different monetization strategies <laughs> using some of these really sacred medicines that require delicacy and, and you know, ta a tactical approach. And I just love that you're evolving and stepping into this space of of uh, container holding with with reverence for how powerful these are, mm -hmm. and for how diverse and individual every person's journey is through these, such that you don't disrespect the the greater process at large. Definitely, one hundred percent. And you know what I found too is like that ability to be able to allow people to have their own individual experiences within the container is everything, right? Because we're not trying to portray that people need cannabis to do this type of work. You don't, right? But at the same time, practicality wise, we're more distracted than ever. We have dopamine hits like crazy. We have instant gratification. And so telling someone that, hey, you know, just go meditate 20 minutes a day and in a year, yeah, you might find something different, right? Or you might have that awareness. Most people are going to be like, okay, I tried 10 minutes, didn't work, right? So <laughs> being able to tap into this in a way that you know, allows people to experience the power while still keeping them tethered to the 3D reality in a way where they're not so blasted that they have challenges coming back to life. Because that's the other thing too. And, 
you know, I had a really interesting conversation with a gentleman named Robert Forte. He'd be a great guest for you guys. I'll, I'll get him uh, on your guys' podcast. But he, um, I mean, he literally, I don't know how I didn't hear about him before, but he was friends with Terrence McKenna, Dennis McKenna, Alexander Shulgin, Timothy Leary, wow. um, like like you name it, Stanislav Grab. He was in there like at that whole time at Esalen in like the early 80s, mid 80s when MDMA first came out. And he watched the entire thing. He was a I believe a researcher of some sort. And he had a very interesting theory around the current popularization of psychedelic medicines where he was saying like, you know, that essentially like most people think MK Ultra when you hear about it, government psyop type thing where they gave LSD to some soldiers, didn't really work out, and they ended it. Well, he was like, well, it actually never ended. He's like, this is kind of like the next phase of it, where now, if you read A Brave New World from Aldous Huxley, he talks about this dystopian future where the 1% powers that be, whatever you want to call them, can get away with anything because anytime society starts to get in an uproar, they just dose them with this medicine called Soma in this book, right? Which is actually uh. a real medicine from back in the day, right? So... So it's very interesting because he was saying that with this current popularization where in the mainstream, Gwyneth Paltrow's got her own show, right? And everyone's doing psychedelics and they're starting to become so less stigmatized very quickly. There's also the potential of falling victim into just numbing out and thinking that you're doing the work because you're going from ceremony to ceremony to ceremony. And that's mm -hmm. part of what I've been seeing in cannabis for a long time, right? Like that's like the main thing I help people with is like, hey, no judgment. If you want to connect with the plant to tune out, awesome. But what is your actual intention? Like, do you really just want to tune out of your life? And so, yeah, it's been really interesting to watch like how, you know, the popularization movement has started. There's a lot of charlatans out there. Again, no judgment, just clear discernment. And again, like, you know, I think that at the end of the day, the ultimate intention of at least my work, and I imagine anyone who's doing this work intentionally, is to be able to allow people to have their entire life become psychedelic. And that happens when you get past the ego long enough to start identifying with that part of you that is infinite in nature. And again, you don't need cannabis for this, but it can be a great pattern interrupt to allow you to at least know why you're going to start meditating every day, mm -hmm. doing breath work, eating healthy. Because if you don't know what the payoff is, especially in the modern day world where everything is about a payoff, if you don't know what the payoff is, it's really hard to understand the why. But if you can have this experience where you go, whoa, that that's that's what there's that's what I'm going to get. OK, cool. Now I'm going to do all the other stuff. And that's what we hold space for to make sure that people are not numbing out, make sure that people like that we're hearing their goals and just holding space to be able to allow them to be supported in reaching those goals. That's so mm -hmm. good. And you, and you perfectly segued into one of the questions that we had for you, which is like you spoke to it a little bit, but maybe we can go a little bit deeper. You know, the the, the narrative, the collective narrative around cannabis has certainly changed in the last, you know, five to 10 years, especially. I know it started earlier than that with certain areas and states mm. legalizing it and everything, but it, it takes a while for people's minds to change about a certain new modality of healing or whatever. And mm. I'm curious what you're, you're, you're seeing as a professional uh, uh, in the the space of the collective attitude towards cannabis. And then, right. you know, maybe we can go in deeper into sort of the lingering issues in the industry, aside from what you just said. Yeah, this is like, I'm like, yes, let's go. Because this <laughs> is so fun. Like, you know, what I found is that you're 100% right, Mimi, like things do take time. Uh, even though, again, we are in a bubble, we get this stuff. Like, I have to remind myself often that, like, you know, it's so funny when people ask, like, an average person, like, so what do you do? And I'm like, if I say cannabis coach, they're going to be like, what is yeah. that? And then I'm like, so I usually just say, like, I'm a coach, <laughs> you know? And so, like, you know, it is really funny, you know, talking about this stuff. Because what I've found overall is that, especially in the last couple of years, and I don't know if it's just because I'm so in this world now of, like, conscious cannabis, but... When I went on Aubrey's podcast, I had Hamilton Souther reach out to me after. And that guy's awesome. I don't know if you guys have had him on yet, but he no. is a gangster. I'll, I'll introduce you to him too. Just remind me. But but um, he hit me up and was like, dude. And I had read about him in a book uh, called Cannabis and Spirituality with, uh, that's written by my good buddy Stephen Gray. Another great podcast guest that remind me, I'll introduce you to him too. So, <laughs> so I had read about Hamilton, this cannabis shaman that's also an ayahuasca arrow. And so I had started talking to him and he's like, dude, I'm so like grateful that you're doing this. He's like, I tried to come out five years ago and talk about this stuff and no one wanted anything of it. Right. And so we hear all the time that we're going through a collective upheaval of a raising of the level of consciousness of planet Earth. 
And I think we're seeing that just play out in everything right now. So what I've been noticing more than anything is a, a clear dichotomy, like two different polarities, if you will, between people that are like, I've, I feel like you took this right out of my brain. I totally get this. And then people that are still so far the other way of like, dude, cannabis isn't that deep, man, you know, and like things like that. And so what I've been noticing within that is that there's just a lot of like, not miseducation, but I would say like, not the full spectrum to use a cannabis pun, not the full spectrum of what is truly out there. And, you know, I think when people are reminded that like, or red pilled, if you will, that like, hey, you guys realize that this whole idea of cannabis being a stupid drug, it's going to make you like Cheecher Chong, no, no diss to them, because I actually love uh, Chong. He's awesome. I'll introduce you to him too. But <laughs> like, you know, he's like, you know, it's like this this image that was cast around cannabis, reefer madness, all these things. This only started in 1930. Before that, cannabis was a part of over 80% of the world's medicines at that time. It was utilized heavily. And there's an author named Chris Bennett that has a book called Lieber 420, Cannabis, Magical Herbs, and the Occult. And he tracks cannabis back over 10,000 years as a part of pretty much every occult practice that has ever been done, right? Wow. So this also goes into the Bible and Jesus's anointing oil and how it's a primitive form of RSO, Rick Simpson oil or FICO as it's like professional name is. And so when I start explaining to people like, hey, guys, like, you know, you can form your own opinions, right? But do the research first, right? Because if you're just going off the last 80 years as if that's the way it's always been, you're missing out on a huge amount of info regarding that. And so that's the biggest thing I've seen is just people genuinely confused when I start talking about this stuff, some people anyway, and then other people are like, I was waiting for someone to come out with this. So it's very interesting. You know, it's like these two different types of conversations I have are like, people are so aware of it, or they're not aware at all. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. You know, and, and I'm curious too about uh, it. It's gotten mainstream, at least in certain parts of the country and, and the West Coast, especially um, mm -hmm. to the degree that you might be at a backyard barbecue and there might be someone hitting a joint as well as slamming a beer. You wouldn't have seen that 10 years ago in, in many of these spaces. Yes. And and it could be like, you know, you just got back from the kids soccer game and you've got a, a cul-de-sac party and, and marijuana is present. And this is like really interesting. And and. I'm curious your perspective on that recreational use. It's it's definitely not one that is spiritual, but nor is it a numbing. It is kind of a, a, a social um, lubricant, if you kind will. Kind of like engaging with whatever activity you're doing. Yeah. Do you see that as like a, a healthy expression of this this habit? Um, do you see that as like kind of just the the introduction introduction to a more uh, profound and and relationship with the plant? Definitely. Like, you know, it's it's very interesting you guys say that because let's look behind the lines at what's really going on there, right? So as I see it, what do people truly want? They want joy, they want connection, right? And some other things as well, love, things like that. So cannabis as opposed to alcohol, right? And again, not to judge alcohol or anything, it's just not my flavor of ice cream, but alcohol does numb you. It actually strengthens the ego, right? And so ego is separation, it's I. I this, I that, we, us, things like that, categorization. And that pulls us farther away from true connection with the facade that we are connecting because we're right next to each other. So how could we not be connecting, right? Whereas cannabis, what it does is it moves you from beta brainwaves into alpha and theta, which alpha is flow state, theta is like the doorway to the subconscious. So now you're moving into a truer sense of not necessarily who you are, but a truer sense of, I guess, who you are, you know? And so being able to go into a more right brain state and be able to like have that experience where time does just pass, right? Like you're not looking at the clock. You actually are connecting because a truer version of yourself is able to come forth, right? Not all the time, you know, but it's able to come forth because certain people, that's why certain people experience anxiety and paranoia, et cetera. Yeah. It's not the only reason, but it's one of the many reasons it's multifaceted. But, you know, when those masks start coming off, there's usually just like a hurting six-year-old inside, right? And so depending on how connected you are to that six-year-old version of yourself, you know, in your inner child, as it's called today, like, you know, the more you are connected to that part of you, the more that you're probably going to enjoy cannabis because it starts just taking off the stuff that was piled on top of you. And so I think this is what's really happening when we look at like, you know, the, the destigmatization of cannabis. But the challenge is, and this is like kind of the thing that I talk about often is that no one is getting a user manual for cannabis. And if they are, it's like, here's what THC means. Here's CBD. 
here's what an edible is and here's how you smoke or vape. It's like very quantitative left brain looking at like, again, great like technologies and things like that, but there's not really a lot about like the spiritual side of cannabis. And so what I'm noticing overall is that there are a lot of people connecting with cannabis and a lot of people that reach out to me are like, I just started, I love it, but it really quickly became an all day, everyday thing. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Right. So I, you know, what I've seen is that like, again, if people are looking for joy and love and these kind of things, and they find that they can get that more often than not with cannabis, and they don't believe they can get it without it, then they end up mistaking cannabis as the moon or sun, mm -hmm. right? And so they end up believing they need this thing to acquire this thing. And so or acquire this state. And so the same thing happens when we outsource our power onto anything in life, right? Whether it be bad food, pornography, coaches, exercise, whatever it is, if we need that thing to feel good, then we're missing the mark, right? Those things can be things of acts of self love that we do for ourselves, because we're curious about things and things like that. But that's the thing I see more often than not. So I see it as a good thing overall, that cannabis is being destigmatized. But I also see an equal need for a really big ramp up in education and honesty, right? Instead of saying, you know, because this is like one of my gripes with the spirituality circles is, and I'm a part of some of these, you know, where they're like, oh, cannabis, huh, you're using intoxicants, you know, and just this like judgment on things like that. And then on the other side, this cannabis industry standard of like, huh, you're trying to tell people you can't smoke all day, every day. It doesn't give you cancer, right? So you have these, again, polarities. Yeah. And all throughout the world right now, we're getting the light shown on polarity. But you have these two things. And my approach always, one of my other core values is the middle way, right? So what if there was a great benefit to being able to connect with a plant medicine that's been utilized for over 10,000 years to raise consciousness, right? But also being making sure that you had structure around that and intention, right? So you didn't fall into the patterns of dependency and things like that. Well, if you can find that sweet spot, right? Well, now you're able to connect with that version of yourself that is infinite, right? Again, what every spiritual doctrine is talking about, whether or not they want you to use intoxicants or not. And you're also able to make sure that it doesn't fall into a coping mechanism like a lot of the industry is in because, you know, and we can get into the industry myths too, because one of the things and the reason I left the industry was because once I went through my personal awakening of this, I couldn't unsee what I was seeing. You know, like, and it wasn't hard to see either people coming in and I'm like, Hey, how's your day going? And they're like, well, it sucks. I hate my job. I have a terrible relationship, but at least I can go buy a bunch of weed. Right. And then I'd send them out the door. Like, well, I just enabled someone to go numb out. Right yeah. now, again, is it my necessarily mission to stop everyone? No, but, but I started feeling it because I had, I had felt it myself. That's why that was the only reason it mattered to me at that point, because I had seen behind the veil from my own reality that I wasn't truly happy when I was just connecting with cannabis unconsciously all day, every day. And so that's one of the, you know, kind of like toxicities I see in the industry is that they are so, and when I say they, like a lot of people, not all of them by any means, but a lot of people, when I even start talking about this stuff in like a typical cannabis circle, they just laugh me off, right? Because they are not ready to see it yet because it's too close to home, right? And they're not aware that like these things are coping strategies. Like no person in a state of joy wakes up and smokes weed all day, every day. You just don't do that. It's just, yeah. it's not a thing you do, you know? Yeah. It's like, I, I've often thought, you know, you go into most, uh, you know, cannabis shops and the demographic, uh, that I feel like the marketing behind a lot of these cannabis and weed products are targeting is the same demographic as like Taco Bell and, yeah. and fast food chains yeah. with, with kind of an angle of leveraging that compulsive behavior and that need to escape through through mm -hmm. pleasure short-term pleasure dopamine and uh, I, I definitely feel that sort of energy in the space uh, that that there's an awareness of that type of demographic as to as it pertains to their habits and almost mm -hmm. a leaning in and encouraging of some of those compulsive pleasure seeking behaviors mm -hmm. and the the piggybacking on that the it's probably not too far off from the the Taco Bell quality. Uh, you know, can you speak to yes. that a little bit? Like if someone's just yes. walking into, you know, cannabis shop X, they're probably getting a, a level of um, quality equal to a fast food or Taco Bell place, right? Yes. And this is like, I'm so excited to talk about this because these are the dirty secrets that most people that walk into a dispensary and purchase a product would never even think of. And why would they, right? There's not really much info out there stating this stuff. So I'm going to use an analogy here. So the same way that at one point 
people looked at people doing steroids and they were like, oh my God, they're so big and amazing. And then their heart explodes, right? So like, what does that look really do if it's actually, it's actually not healthy whatsoever, right? So that's the same thing going on with cannabis right now. People are only interested in how high the Delta 9 THC is and what the flower looks like. But really at the end of the day, like, you can grow cannabis with chemical salt nutrients. You can grow in bacterially rich soils that do things such as ramp up the Delta 9 THC, right? And then also make the flower look nice. Now, again, depending on how deep into the world of cannabis you are, you can definitely tell things. But the average consumer walking in that just sees cannabis that looks shiny is going to be like, oh, it's amazing. Plus, they have all these certain names and all the things like that, right? So just the flower alone. You know, most of the growers that are cultivating cannabis, again, not all, because there are some really amazing growers out there growing with living soil, growing with organic methods, et cetera. But the same way that like, you know, I imagine people listening to your podcast will definitely resonate with this. I choose organic medicine because I eat organic food. I prioritize high quality sleep. I prioritize spring water. Like, so why would I then go buy cannabis that was grown with steroids, right? Like that doesn't make any sense. And so a lot of people were like, well, you know, where's the science behind it? And I'm like, listen, there is so much to science that is currently not being uh, made available because it doesn't fit the Newtonian Cartesian way of looking at life, which is I only see, I can only uh, believe in what I can see and measure. And even though science says at the same time that we only see 4% of visible reality. So when I talk about the energy of the grower who grew it, right, there's always someone that's like, that doesn't make any sense, right? And I'm like, yeah, because you're looking at it from a very 3D Newtonian way of looking at things, which is, is there a test result that shows the energy? Well, no, right? And then I always share with these people this, this uh, little uh, analogy, which is, imagine you have someone in your life that you love, right? Imagine you have two people in your life that you love. Can you tell me in units of love how much love you have for each person? No, but you know that thing that is unable to be measured still exists, right? So everyone understands this on some deep level. They just have yet to apply it to all of their life. And so the energy of the grower who grew your medicine is paramount because, you know, if you go into like shamanistic cultures, or even if you read the adventures of Don Juan, they talk about like to cultivate a plant medicine it was a role for someone in society that like was spending all of their time in very high levels of consciousness because they were tasked with providing medicine for the community and they had to have their shit on point. Yeah. And these days, when it comes to most people like, you know, cultivating cannabis, it's people that are growing in states of stress, anxiety, not having done any inner work on themselves, using chemical salt nutrients, growing under, yeah, you know, LED lights that are emitting EMFs and all these things. And none like, you know, like, it's not that any of these things are inherently bad. It's that when you put all of them together and then you're serving this as medicine that's getting given to other people and they're unaware of like, why do I feel sometimes good and sometimes so fucked up from cannabis? And there's just all this misinformation out there. So that's just the flower side. Now let's get into the real nitty gritty, right? <laughs> so the flower side enough is, is pretty wild, but this is going to get a little crazy. So I'll go into edibles first. I'll save vapes for last because that's the real sweet spot. So, so with edibles, right? Like, you know, think about if you ever, you know, we all know that like if you look at the back of a Skittles wrapper, right, and you read the ingredients, you're like, what the fuck is any of that? I <laughs> yeah. can't even pronounce yeah. these things, right? Well, if you go into most dispensaries and you look at the back of these, you know, gummies and cookies and things like that, it's very similar ingredients. It's straight up poison. And then what's in there is typically, and this is going to actually get in a little bit in what we're going to talk about with vapes, but it's going to be CO2 distillate a lot of the times. Now, in the industry, distillate is known as poop soup, right? Ugh. So essentially what it is, and this is like one of the dirty secrets of the industry, is if you have a very high overhead, cannabis, like the world of cannabis is cutthroat, right? Yeah. So a lot of people think like, oh, dispensaries, you must be killing it. No, like they're not. Like I've worked on them like they're not. And so, I mean, there's probably a couple that are, but like, you know, most of them are thugging it out. Like they are doing everything they can to beat out the other dispensaries in town. So let's picture that you're a vertically integrated uh, cannabis operation. So what that means is you have everything under one roof. You have your cultivation site, you have your lab, you have your retail, you have your order fulfillment, everything is under one roof. And then let's picture that you're just a cultivation facility, right? So you have all these plants growing and that's your money, right? That's how everything comes through. Now, let's say that through a series of unfortunate events, you get powdery mildew or you get spider mites or you get something that essentially just completely annihilates your crop, right? 
Now, in certain parts of the country, they really don't have stringent testing. So they'll just sell that stuff to you, right? And that's another dirty secret. In Massachusetts, they do have pretty strict testing. So what they will do is they will take all of that flour and they will run it through a couple of different processes. One is actually like a remediation device that can like take mold out of flour. I don't even know what to say about that. The second thing that is much more commonly seen, the other thing is getting more common now, but they'll make it into CO2 distillate. So basically it goes through a process where you have to extract the terpenes, the essential oils from the plant. Mm -hmm. Then you put it through this uh, CO2 critical distillator, which essentially creates this like uh, oil from the uh, solvent of CO2. And then from there, you'll reintegrate sometimes anyway, the terpenes back in. Now, if you're making edibles, you usually don't. Um, vaporizer carts, you will. Sometimes they put botanical terpenes in there. It's not like flowers. It's very weird. Um, but now you, now you have this, this oil that, yeah, might look golden and it's amazing, right? And it actually will test like for no mold and things like that, right? So it's not like they're like giving you mold when they make this. I want to make that very clear. But if we bring in the energy of the grower who grew it, versus like also the energy of the medicine as a whole what is the energy of medicine that was not properly cared for that now has mildew and spider mites and all these things getting put through this really weird process and now being sold at top dollar for people to take as medicine right so that's a lot of the times what's in a lot of these edibles and also in your vaporizer carts now in vaporizer cartridges there's also some people will say, no, I get live resin carts. You know, I don't I don't do CO2. Well, cool. Live resin's made with a, uh, a solvent called butane. Right. And so, you know, when you're working with these hydrocarbons, who knows? Right. Like, you know, we've all seen the mesothelioma ads. Right. Like if you were, you know, exposed to this, you're entitled conversation. Right. So there's like a safe amount of how many PPMs of butane are allowed to be left in a product before it is sold. But how long until we realize that that's not healthy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, for anyone who's hit a butane dab before, no matter how awesome or fire it is, like your lungs take about, I don't know, five, 10 minutes to just like be able to take a full breath again. Yeah. I do not believe that can be good. Like, I mean, it does not take a rocket scientist to understand that if your lungs are going into contraction like that, there's something in there that is that is really toxic. And when you're interacting with, say, a live rosin or a bubble made hash or something like that. Those are also concentrates that do not make your lungs feel like that. So it's not that concentrates are bad or anything like that. Now, the other thing is that people ask me all the time, well, what if I could find a live rosin cartridge, right? So you got live rosin, which is not made with any uh, hydrocarbons. Rosin versus resin, I'll get into that so people understand this too. Live resin, butane. Live rosin and rosin in general is heat, water, pressure, and ice, right? Depending on if it's rosin or live rosin. So again, no solvents. But let's say you take that medicine and you now put it into this vaporizer cartridge. Well, these cartridges are made in China and they leach heavy metals into it. And you can actually go search this article. So in 2018 or 2019, right around there, there was a big vape crisis going on. So this was happening on the black market, right, where people were interacting with vaporizer cartridges and they were getting popcorn lung and they were sometimes dying from this. And it was because they discovered that someone was cutting the medicine with vitamin E acetate, which on its own, not that big of a deal. When it's combusted, right, and put heat to it, turns into a totally different molecular structure Jesus. and it can create popcorn lung and all these things, right? So Massachusetts, I was working in the industry at this time, they decided, you know what, even though we know we're not putting vitamin E acetate in there, we're going to pull our carts just to be safe, right? So they pull all the carts and they start testing them again. But now they're testing them like... Normally, the way they tested these is the, the CO2 distillate or whatever final product comes out. They test that. They go, it's clean. They put it in the cartridge, right? So now they're testing cartridges that have been sitting on the shelves for a certain amount of time, right? They're testing them now, and they're like, what the fuck? Why is lead in here? Why is cadmium in here? Why is all these different heavy metals in here? Well, because the cartridge shells themselves are leaching these things into the medicine. Now, that's bad enough. But then once again, you're adding heat to this. What happens to heavy metals, lead, et cetera, when you're putting heat and you're inhaling it? Who fucking knows, right? But it's mm -hmm. not good, you know? Yeah. And so these are just some of the industry secrets that again, like if someone listening to this wants to walk away being empowered, this is why you want to grow your own medicine. Mm -hmm. If you if you 100% can, you should, right? And it's very easy to do so. If someone does not have the ability to grow their own, now you have a lot of things to look for when you go to dispensaries, right? And there are dispensaries that are very in alignment with this viewpoint. 
And I'm actually compiling a list right now of different wow, dispensaries that like people can go to because people hit me up all the time. Hey, I'm in such and such a you know place. Can you recommend a dispensary? Right. And I'm like, ah, I, I want to put together a list for this. So, you know, there's certain terminology that you can look for. And I'll give this here so people can walk away with this. So it all comes down to, in my mind, how the cannabis is grown and what the intention is in it and what the intention is of the company. Right. And a lot of these companies like MedMen and True Leave and Cure Leaf are just like not my flavor of ice cream to put it very lightly you know i could definitely say choice you can be words, real but, ryan you know, be yeah real. yeah it's like you know these people just don't have any place working with medicine they all the only reason they're here is because some projection on a spreadsheet showed this was their next cash cow and now they're here and they will be willing to do whatever the fuck it takes to make money they don't care about any of their consumers patients whatever they can say they do but actions speak much louder than words right and i've seen these actions time after time after time and this is in Massachusetts where we do have strict testing. Imagine what happens in places like Oregon where you don't really have any testing, right? And so when you look at places like Maine, for instance, they have really kept out most of these MSOs, multi-state organizations. And so it's a lot of mom and pop stuff. So they don't have a lot of testing up there either. But the difference is they actually really care. Most of them are in black market for years. They're now legal and they really care about it. You know, like their patients and their consumers and their customers are their family. Right. And they know that like there's a lot of diversity up there in terms of like different places to go. So if they give someone an experience that's not good, it's going to get around. Right. And so we've lost a lot of that in a lot of the other places because these big MSOs have millions of dollars and they just drive out everyone else. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like Cure Relief, True Leave, like like, you know, these kind of places, again, just look into them, right? Look into their backstories. Yeah. You know, that's what I'll say. Uh, I'm curious if you've had this question before, as I'm feeling the anxiety rise in my body from my consumption of cannabis in my 20s through probably <laughs> the worst possible <laughs> means. Uh, do you have any sort of detoxification protocol? What do you suggest people who've got a history of consuming the Taco Bell version of mm cannabis in their in their past and and like myself and many others who grew up in communities where cannabis mm -hmm. was prevalent you know washington state yeah. was where we're from that's mm. like one of the first very progressive in that space um and you know we've gone through uh like various detoxes over the last few years so i feel i feel maybe that like some of that was was captured but do you have a specific protocol for detoxifying uh from this this version of cannabis use that has so much toxicity Definitely. That's a great question. So, you know, my methodologies for this differ depending on the individual and like what their current symptoms are, things like this. But I'll give like a general structure of things one could do. Um, and again, I'm not a medical professional, so take this with a grain of salt. But this is what I found really worked for me and also for other people when they've gone through this. So the first thing is you got to disconnect from the medicine you're connecting with. So if you start noticing, and again, the symptoms are all over the place, right? Like you're not going to have like a strict set of symptoms that will show someone that they're like, you know, uh, in toxicity from cannabis or these kind of things. But typically what I say is you want to make sure that you get away from whatever cannabis you're using that might be adding to this issue, right? Or whatever form of cannabis, whether it be vape cards, edibles, et cetera. Once you've gotten away from that and you either just start taking a complete break from cannabis or you start finding higher quality medicine, what you can do is things like charcoal. Um, I love taking charcoal in the morning and night. That's great for like GI detox and a lot of other things as well. Sauna is amazing. Uh, and I just found they have these like $150 saunas on Amazon uh, that are kick ass, right? And so you don't need to have like a $3,000 sauna yeah. or have a lot of land to do it. Um, sauna is amazing for this kind of stuff, right? Um, also lymphatic drainage, like doing the big six and like, you know, just doing lymphatic pulling and things like that. Castor oil packs, red light, um, you know, spirulina, chlorella. Um, uh, there's some other things too. Jason Ganzuk actually has me on a really cool detox profile right now, just from some mold and stuff mm. um, that I got into my system somehow. But those are some of the easiest things that someone can do. Like castor oil is very cheap. Um, you can get the pack that just goes right in your liver. Um, Cause again, like your liver is going to get a lot of this stuff, especially with yep. heavy metals and things like that. And, you know, I don't want to scare anyone with this stuff. Like they might like literally be like, Hey, I'm using cannabis right now for cancer treatment. And I don't know if it's clean. So what I want to say is just do your best with this information, right? Like, don't let it be like, Oh my God. Cause it is a lot. Right. And this didn't all happen for me like overnight. This is like 10 years of me, like diving into this stuff. 
So just start with what you can control, right? So if you're someone currently using vape carts, just go to flower, right? Even if the flower is grown by a grower that wasn't in the right energetic, you know, structure or frequency, even if it was grown with chemical salts, it's going to be much better than interacting with heavy metals from, you know, a vape cart, yeah. right? And things like that, uh, and butane and whatever other hydrocarbons. So, you know, there's a stepping stone process for this, but yeah, that's a great place to start is like charcoal, castor oil packs. If you can hit a sauna, awesome. Um, you know, lymphatic drainage, just doing the pulling, things like that. Those yeah. are some great things to start with for sure. Yeah, that's really great. I mean, we live in a world where those are those are really important, uh, regardless of whether you have a history of cheap cannabis exactly. use. I mean, just just doing a proper liver cleanse or liver supporting protocol for a while changes your complete world. Like uh, that's yeah. something that I, I took way too long to figure out. I had adrenal exhaustion in my 20s and I took, you know, God knows what through my liver. And it wasn't until I was in my 30s and did a proper liver cleanse that I realized how much it supported my adrenals, how much it supported my stress response, which then supported my testosterone and my vitality. And all of a sudden I'm putting muscle on and my sex is better. And all because I'm finally hyper-focusing on cleansing and, and looking at my liver mm -hmm. from all of the things that I've done to it over the years. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, Paul Check's visual of the different stress buckets, which we've talked about before, where it's like you have so much stress pouring into these different buckets and the body is trying to get back to balance and homeostasis. So these buckets are flowing into each other and you start to note because we're one enclosed system, not even enclosed. Mm. We are an open energy system with the things ar around us, of course, mm. but these stress buckets start to flow into each other. And so it, it's not an easy connection and you don't know what you don't know. You're having these symptoms and it, you know, it, it seems so simple to it's like, oh yeah, let's cleanse the organ that is filtering out all this bullshit. Yeah. Because it's popping up in other in area in other areas of your life. Like it makes so much sense, but it's it's simple, <laughs> like you said. It's it's not always easy to get to the bottom of. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, honestly, my best advice for anyone that really wants to take this to the next level is to work with Dr. Jason Ganzuk. I mean, dude, that guy has brought my mineral status back from I mean, luckily I was in a pretty good spot, but this is another thing that you know, not many people think about with plant medicines. So I want to uh, architect an image here, right? So let's think about the average human being. Let's think about even us, right? Like we are aware, I'm sure your listeners too, we're aware of health and we still come into challenges, right? Because in the modern day world, all this toxicity, the topsoil is being depleted, all these things, right? Let's think about the average person that like is eating God knows what, uh, watching shitty television, all these things. No judgment, just again, I'm just painting a picture, right? So now let's hear, let's think about this person Hearing about ayahuasca, right, or psilocybin or any of these things, truly wanting to go connect with this medicine because they really feel like this will help them. They go do this, but they're already in a state of toxicity and mineral depletion because everything comes back to minerals, right? And so they then go, they connect with this plant. They're probably not going to be able to have a very full spectrum ceremony because your mineral status is going to allow you to actually like have your experience, right? And then afterwards, because ayahuasca, cannabis, all of these medicines do take minerals from us as well, they're now in this like really depleted state. And now they're being sent back after this crazy eye-opening journey to go try to integrate, even though literally your ability to integrate is also related to your ability to have a healthy mineral status, right? So these are the things that, you know, in the modern like popularization of these medicines is one of the things that I feel it's my duty to start educating people on because you know, if you are unaware of how minerals rule everything, and then you're going with good intentions to connect with a medicine, you at best are just going to waste your money, right? Because you're not going to be able to have the full experience, or it's going to be overly challenging. At worst, you could like really get into like adrenal fatigue or any of these kind of like slow oxidizer, you know, type uh, states where your body just kind of like craps out, you know, and so you know, and then what do people do? Oh, I must need coffee, I must have an Advil deficiency, you know, and so like, you know, it's like, these kind of things. And again, it's just because I feel we've been misguided as a society and our priorities and values overall have been skewed, right? Like most of us, especially like, you know, even me, I've had to like really look into this stuff. Like most of us are, are trained to achieve, right? Like we are here to achieve, to build, to conquer, right? And that's why we're here. And so everything else is secondary. That's why fast food exists, right? Hey, just get your food quick and get back to work, right? Because you got to go thug it out and provide, right? And do these yep. things. 
and and for women, right? Like, you know, yeah, you got to have babies and do all these things and deal with all these things, but you also have to go to work and do all this shit, right? So there's this pressure on us, a societal pressure. And as a result of that, like we're eating the shitty food, we're doing all these things, and it's just not doing anything good for our mineral status and just our overall health and vitality. And then again, we're hearing about psychedelics, we want to go do them. And cannabis being the most prevalent one, you know, I truly feel that a lot of the reason that people get dependent on cannabis, and I haven't tested this yet, this is a theory of mine, is because they're in a mentally depleted state. And because cannabis allows them to have a glimpse of like something different, the same way that if you're really tired, and you want to experience energy, you'll drink coffee, but it's not truly energy, it's just turning off the signals in your brain that tell you you're tired, you know, so it's the same kind of thing. And I think that that's where a lot of people as you start remineralizing, will notice a lot of things, but one of them being like, you're just not necessarily called to connect with those protectors in your life, those things that were allowing you to feel good, some sense of the word as often, you know, and so that's one of the things I've noticed as well in different clients I've worked with. And, you know, in working with Jason myself, I went to him just because I was like, oh, I'm like, I had him on the podcast. And I was like, this is blowing my mind. Like, I want to get my HTMA test hair test mineral analysis, and see what's going on. So luckily, by the time I went to him, you know, it was like, okay, everything's good, but you could definitely optimize. And if you kept going like this, it probably wouldn't have ended well, right. Mm. And so just him putting me on this, and again, I'm doing all the quote, unquote, right things, you know, and him putting me on this, my whole life has shifted, wow. like all this awareness coming out. And he talks about how like, you know, if you have a uh, an excess of calcium, for instance, right, you're going to be emotionally unavailable. And so what I love about his approach is that it's practical. It's not just like, oh, you have too much calcium. Well, why does that matter? Right? He actually tells you how it will relate to all these different areas of like physically this is what you'll experience emotionally you'll be like this mentally you'll have brain fog spiritually you'll not know who the hell you are and when you don't know who you are you'll take anyone's advice and opinion on whether or not they think they know who you are hey i know who you are just come do this thing okay cool outsourcing power over and over and over again where in reality my ultimate intention is to teach people how to fish rather than just give them a fish, right? No. Be able to hold the space, be able to teach them things they can do on their own, they can spread to their friends and family so that I can leave the Garden of Earth a little greener than when I found it, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've <laughs> never heard that with cannabis and other plant medicines um, depleting your minerals, have you? I'm not, no. I, I would love for yeah. you, if you can explain, if you're able to explain that mechanism of action of how plant medicines, or maybe there's only certain ones that affect minerals. Cause we, we talk about minerals quite a bit that we, we consume, that we use them daily because obviously everything in the body is uh, controlled by minerals. Um, but yeah, if you could go into that a little bit more, you know, for my own curiosity. Definitely. And, you know, I'll say that I'm not an expert at this by any means, but this is what I've learned so far from Jason. So like, think about it this way, right? Even exercise takes minerals from us. We sweat, things like that, right? So caffeine, that will take things. It's like revving us, right? So all of these plant medicines, they are releasing neurotransmitters. They're working on neural pathways. Some are promoting neurogenesis, all these different mechanisms in the body. And those take power, right? And so when you look at the minerals, that most of these medicines are taking. Um, I actually interviewed Hamid Jabbar recently, the mineral shaman. That guy's awesome too. Remind me wow. to connect you to him as well. He's great. Uh, and him and Jason's approaches are very similar, but he's been doing this a little longer specifically with ayahuasca. And he knows a little bit about cannabis too. So every medicine is going to be a little different with regards to what individual minerals or ratios of minerals they affect. But typically, most psychedelic medicines will affect calcium. Now, when I was talking about before, if you have an excess of calcium, which can happen from a myriad of different issues, if you have an excess of calcium, that's going to create like a heart wall, right? Like just like an imperviability to emotion, right? So I see this happening a lot specifically in the world right now, right? It happened with me for a while, right? Where I was just like, I just can't really feel things. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know why. But all of a sudden, I connect with psychedelics and whoa, I see all this stuff. I feel all these things, right? So one of the things they do is they drop your calcium, right? When you connect with a psychedelic. And so all of a sudden, now you're feeling all these things, mm -hmm. right? And then you come back to your day to day life, whatever you're doing to make your calcium go so high happens again. And you're like, man, I must need that experience again, because I just can't feel emotion of my own, right? Cue dependency, cue externalizing your power, etc. I know cannabis goes after copper, specifically, and copper is a very feminine medicine. And so or uh, mineral rather. And so when you look at like these relationships between minerals, you have like calcium, magnesium, male, female, you have iron and copper, male, female, right? So it's not as easy as just saying like, 
oh, just go out and buy some copper every time you connect with cannabis, right? It's not that simple. Um, and that's where like the tests really come in handy because everyone's individual biochemistry is, is different, right? And so, you know, the main intention uh, with all of this is just to allow people to be aware of this because I think that the more that we are aware, like this stuff doesn't really cost a lot. Like an HTMA test is like, I think 120 bucks and working with Jason is not too much money, especially compared to the amount you'll spend trying to come back from disease when it happens. Um, plus you get to enjoy it. I mean, like think about it this way, right? When you go to someone like Jason, it's like taking your car to get tuned, you know, like now, do you want to wait until your engine blows and then be like, I can't go anywhere. I got to wait. I got a new engine and all the money I could have put into making my engine better. Now just has to go into a new stock engine, right? Like versus being able to go to someone and go, I don't know what's really under the hood. I don't really know what I could do, or maybe I have some experience or maybe an athlete or these kind of things, but just curious, right? And they illuminate for you like, oh, you could do these couple things, take these couple supplements, boom, 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 do another test. And all of a sudden now you're fucking revving, right? Like, you know, that to me is always worth it. The best investment you'll ever make is in yourself, right? We've heard that a million times. It's cliche, but at the same time, it's very true, right? And so being able to dive into minerals like this, especially within the world of plant medicine is paramount. Now, what what Hamid does is he actually guides people down to Peru to sit with a shaman, things like that, and do ayahuasca, but he does a mineral panel before and after. And so what he's doing is he's like aware of this and he's making sure that when people come back, they're remineralizing efficiently before they go down, they're remineralizing if they're in a depleted state. So when they go down there, they can really get the best bang for their buck and also have the best experience down there to be able to actually do what people are going down there to do, which is to create awareness and ultimately create a higher degree of fulfillment in life and more joy in life. And so that's like the most I know right now with regards to it. Me and Jason are actually talking about building out a course for this and everything. And it's 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 super new tech for me. And I love this stuff because, you know, even though I'm a very spiritual person, I do love the science too, because yeah. I believe they're all connected. Like it's two sides of the same coin. And that's, I could go on a whole tangent about the whole, it's science, it's spirituality. I'm like, why would you want it to be either or? It's yeah, both, yeah, you know? Yeah. Like, what do you think created the science? Like, you know what I mean? So, yeah, exactly. It, it makes so much practical sense, yeah. you know, now that you've articulated it as such. And, and, and I love how much of a component this can be in integration, which is often mm -hmm. the step that's skipped. Uh, and it makes so much sense with the 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 calcium that you're talking about. When you think about something calcifying, it's literally hardening. And yeah. if, you, if you have an excess of calcium, you're going to see more rigidity in the body. And not only necessarily, I'm sure, in the heart space, but in other, you know, blood vessels, capillaries, things like that. Like it makes so much sense. Even just the word calcifying, hardening. Yeah. I think it's more evidence to that. Yeah. And we've heard it with like the calcified pineal gland, you know, and how, what that does, but it's not just that that gets calcified. Right. And also there are things like fluoride and things like that, that also added this calcification. So it's not like you're eating too much calcium. That could be one way of doing it, right. If you're taking too much calcium or something, but for most people, it's going to be like fluoride, uh, showering and unfiltered water, things like that, that again, your skin is your largest organ, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and you're drink at least when you're drinking tap water, it's getting filtered through your liver and kidneys. It's still obviously toxic to those organs, but when you're showering and it's going directly into you, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, again, this is like why I say often, it's like, it is about cannabis, but it's about everything deeper too, because in order to have cannabis work like this, there's certain things that we can do to optimize it. And then once we can have cannabis work like that, it's really about what comes out as a result, right? And so like, that's really what we're diving into in all the programs. The mineral stuff isn't in there yet. We're, we're creating that right now. But, you know, it's like, you know, this kind of stuff allows people to just be like, oh, I just didn't know, you know, yeah. and most yep. people, if they knew this, would be like, oh, like, I'll take those things on because we're not talking about anything that's super expensive, right? Castor oil packs, maybe a red light's expensive, a sauna, 150 bucks. Um, getting a shower filter, 30 bucks, like, you know, you don't have to break the bank to do these things. Yeah. Uh, and for most people, you know, if they think they can't afford it, you know, sometimes, yeah, you might actually not be able to right now and you can save for it. But for most people, you know, I know if you were like me before I got into all this stuff, you know, I was also spending $5 on Dunkin' Donuts coffees, you know, like, you know, 12 years ago and all these things. And I don't have money, but really it was just, I wasn't prioritizing my health in the right yeah. way because I didn't understand why it would matter. And I think that's the other thing too, is like, you know, I always want to leave episodes with like understanding people understanding why this matters, you know, and so that's why I love diving into this stuff. Because if I just say like, oh, look at your minerals, oh, connect with cannabis consciously, they're like, why, you know, like, and I never yeah. want to be someone that just gives people more rules to follow. I don't think humanity really likes any more rules than we're already living under. So the idea is like, this is actually on a physiological level, 
and emotional, mental, and spiritual, how you red pill yourself out of the matrix in a multitude of different ways, right? And it's kind of like a buffet, right? It's not just getting a coach or a guide or whatever. It's not just connecting with plant medicines. It's not just having a spiritual practice. It's not just eating healthy. It's all of it. But the idea is you just start with one thing and slowly but surely, you just integrate it all in, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's really fascinating. I know you guys know it, you know? It's like, you know, every how you do anything is how you do everything. So if you start putting this kind of intention into the cannabis, well, you're going to reap some really positive results. And then you're going to be like, what happens if I start doing this in my food and my water? And then it just, it keeps going, getting better and better and better. And that's the best thing is like, it's really never peaked for me. Like I've, I've still continued to find better and better levels of living through being able to apply all of these things to my cannabis use, to my life as a whole, you know? And so it's been really interesting. Yeah. I, I thank you for sharing all of that. It's critical oh, yeah. and, and some new information uh, for sure to be implemented. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious. And as we talk about kind of like up leveling the, the use mm -hmm. of this medicine, um, even in the last couple of years that, you know, we've gotten to know you, our conversations with like Jared Picard and Paul check, um, the consumption of cannabis in our life has totally changed radically. And it started with quality, felt the, the changes in the quality and the way that we consume it. But even for, for me, and I'll just speak for myself, it's evolved into this spiritual medicine that I mm. actually, you know, believed. I was like, oh yeah, I know it totally can help you get in touch with, with something a little more metaphysical, but you know, in the last year or so, it's it's really transformed the way that I even you know meditate, and mm. um, and I'm so curious to get your take on what is happening spiritually. And so, like a practice for us would be consuming in the evening, and what starts with you know we're sitting out on our deck, we're watching the sunset over San Diego, and and we're having like really amazing conversation. So much of yeah. which gets funneled yeah. into what <laughs> ideas galore. Like content, thirty percent right? of our co <laughs> podcast content starts on our patio at night. Yes, but then you know we yes. eventually go to bed. And as I'm going to sleep, um, I'm sort of laying there in, in what can be a five or twenty minute experience, and I'm closing my eyes. I am flying, man. I'm like traveling through the stars. What feels like. I'm in the Millennium Falcon and I'm hitting lights <laughs> and I don't, I don't essentially know what ha what's happening. Some days my body like vibrates. Some days I don't even feel like I'm in my body. It's not like the way that people articulate astral traveling where they're flying through the rooms or they're over a city or anything. I'm in what feels like another dimension. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, it's not uber conscious, but it's enough to be noticeable and I'm curious if you have experience with this, if this sounds familiar, how have you been able to articulate or rationalize this? Yeah, this is a great question. And, and you know, I love that you guys mentioned the patio things because things start as ideas, right? And this is like the best term I can find <laughs> for like those sparks of inspiration that yeah. cannabis can allow us to tap into. Mm -hmm. And so there's a couple of different things going on here, right? So I'll talk on like a, a physical level first and I'll move it more into like the spiritual and things cool. like that. So we know that if melatonin is a precursor to endogenous DMT, obviously most of us know what DMT can do, right? And what its role is. But if melatonin is a precursor to endogenous DMT and cannabis also produces melatonin, and then you just said that at night, usually this is when this is happening, when your body is switching from serotonin to melatonin. And what's happening is you're having an abundance of precursor on hand from which to convert into endogenous DMT. So within that, there's a whole spectrum of things that can happen, wild experiences, right? Now, as I talked about before, too, you're also entering an alpha and theta brainwave state. So you're out of your analytical mind and more into your right brain, which is much more being, right? Much more yeah. I am rather than like trying to categorize it. It's just you can just exist there and be everything instead of saying, oh, I am this, I am that. It's just I am, period, like yeah. I am, you know? And so being able to enter that state of I am consciousness plus having the extra endogenous DMT on hand from the extra melatonin, um, plus having the right people around you that can stimulate your mind, plus also being able to, you know, really allow yourself to tap into your inner child and all these parts of you that are behind those parts of the analytical mind that might keep you a little more serious, a little more regimented, a little more structured, which again, are necessary. Like those parts are not bad by any means. But when you're putting all of those things together, plus you have the high quality cannabis as well that was grown by someone who really loves it, it was made with intention, and then you're setting a conscious intention, you have all these things happening that allow for some really wild experiences, you know? And I don't know if you guys have tried breath work with cannabis yet, but it is absolutely fantastic because if breathing, right, if, if endogenous DMT is also produced in the lungs, 
And like we already went over, you have more precursor on hand. You can have some really wild transcendental experiences Mm -hmm. because then what you're doing through a series of, you know, breathing, depending on what style you're doing, most styles will work this way. You're circulating cerebral spinal fluid through breath work, right? And then as you're doing these holds, you're having that cerebral cerebral spinal fluid fly up to the top of the sutra in the back of your skull, Mm -hmm. press on the pineal gland and these little tiny crystals in there create this piezoelectric effect that creates this transducer of of an antenna that picks up these super high vibe frequencies and sends your brain waves into gamma waves. It's like, you know, you put all these things together and you can have some really profound experiences. And that's where people can really like what you guys are experiencing is exactly like, and I'm sure you guys already know this, but this is what I mean when I say like cannabis is a psychedelic. It truly is. It's just not as it's a little like it's feminine, right? So it's not going to reveal itself all at once, right? Like yeah, that's one guy will, yeah. or you know, it's like it's a little like, let me see if I can trust you. Let me see how much you can handle, you know. And and again, it will bring things up for people that maybe they weren't ready to handle. Things like that can happen. But the more that you tell the plan and show the plan through your actions and through your intention, like I can go there. You yeah. know, the plan will be like, okay, you know. Yeah. And I recently had a uh five gram mushroom experience. I hadn't done one in a couple of years and So I, me and Rachel, we made a 10 gram tea, split it and went and laid down. And I mean, absolute hilarity. I love psilocybin for a lot of reasons, but I got to once again, meet the spirit of cannabis. And I've had this happen before, but it was so funny because, you know, she was like, oh, here you are again. Like, you know, we do this dance in every lifetime, Ryan, you know, you get way too into me. Then you realize you need your space. You need to become your own man. And then we become a power couple, you know? And, (laughs) and so we were laughing together, but she's like, remember when you used to blame me for why your life wasn't working out the way you wanted it to? And I was like, yeah, she's like, that was silly. Wasn't it? You know, and just having this hilarious conversation with really seeing like how sassy the spirit of cannabis is. And Hamilton's talked about this too. You know, a lot of ayahuascaros, they don't want cannabis a part of the ceremony because they're like, oh, it calls them too many spirits. It's too annoying, right? People like Hamilton, they love the spirit of cannabis because it is like, I mean, it's pure feminine energy. It is a little bit chaotic, right? Like it's a little bit wild. And I personally love that. But it was just so funny to be able to be in that experience and laugh about all of the challenges I blamed on cannabis back in the day. And so again, if you think about cannabis as like a collective spirit, right? Like The plant's been traumatized in a lot of ways. The plant doesn't really know who it can trust, who it can show itself to. And again, like for people that, again, probably not on your podcast, but for people that haven't heard these kind of things, they'll be like, this is so woo-woo. But it's true, right? Like plants are living beings. Everything is sentient, right? It's the Everything is information. We're just exchanging information with our environment all of the time. It never stops. No matter what is in your environment, you're, you're exchanging. Exactly. You know, it's a, it's a reciprocity. And so, you know, it's just so funny to be able to look into those things, but that is, you know, some of the things I imagine there's many more too, that lead to those types of experiences, you know, and, and again, like you can astral travel with cannabis, you can remote view, you can do those things. And sometimes like, unlike in a sober state where you got to have to work for those things, they can just happen with cannabis, Mm -hmm. you know, and other psychedelics too. But you know, I think cannabis really catches people off guard because they just don't expect it. You know, like yeah. psilocybin. Yeah, I'll expect it. Yeah. LSD, I'll expect it. MDMA, I know what to expect. Cannabis is kind of just this like, you know, for people that don't know how to work with it, it's this Russian roulette. But it's actually like you can learn how to work with it. It's mm-hmm. very like similar to like just feminine energy, right? You got to give it a direction and it will be like, boom, and it will bring you there. Yeah. You know, probably not in the way that you assumed, but it will bring you there. <laughs> yeah, personally, I, you know, on the note of cannabis being or not being a psychedelic, I would say when we were consuming it out of mostly cartridges in our 20s here and there, not really regularly, but here and there, I would I would get anxiety and paranoia. And there was no like deeper levels of consciousness, deeper thinking going on. It was just kind of a goofy, fun, sort of paranoid time. And now I know that there's so many factors. Obviously, the, the quality that we uh, interact with now is top, top, top shelf. And so that paranoia and anxiety isn't there. But what I do notice is that I can literally feel in certain strains that we have, I can feel like a plugging in and a connection of parts of my brain that don't feel as accessible in my masculine hat work day. And when yes. I'm relaxing, I'm with my love, I feel, you know, and working with the feminine sort of plant medicine, I feel these connections being made in my brain. I will literally tell Chase, like, I just had a connection I've never had before. And it's so, 
it's so enlivening. It's so engaging to feel, oh my gosh, I've just had a thought that I've never had before. And I can't believe I've never had this thought before because it's (laughs) coming in, you know, like a fire hose in in the best way download where it's like, oh my. So that really does have a similar um, feel to some of the other classic psychedelics. Um, But I, I would say also it's, you know, there is this this micro and macro of connection that you're talking about where I can feel parts of myself connecting on a deeper level, but then I also feel deeper connection with Chase. It's like micro, macro, it, it's happening everywhere if the intention is providing that space to have that experience. 100%. It's kind of like this, right? And I might have used this analogy in the last podcast, but it's it's a really good one. So it's kind of like if you are a sick child, right? And your mom asks you, what do you want? How can I help you? And you don't say anything. She's not going to do anything, right? But if you tell her, I want chicken noodle soup from my favorite restaurant, she's going to go and get that, right? And so with cannabis, she's just waiting for us to tell her what we want, right? But most of us are not living an intentional life. So why would we randomly think to do that with cannabis, right? But as soon as you start doing that, you start actually building your relationship with the plant. It's not something you're using anymore. It's something you're connecting with. It's a living entity, right? And it makes so much sense, Mimi, what you said, because, you know, when you are like diving into the world of cannabis, you're leaving that left brain state, entering the right brain state that we've talked about, but also, right, like, and this is my theory here, you're entering the mind of a child. When it comes to this idea of like being in the mind of a child, I'm not a religious person, but I know a good line when I hear it. And the Bible states, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must first enter the mind of a child. Now, what is heaven and hell? Heaven is beyond the ego. Hell is being so structured in the ego that you don't know anything else exists. It's separation from everything, right? And so think about this, right? If cannabis is a connection medicine, that's how I view it anyway, right? If it's a connection medicine, and then you're connecting with the plant, you're therefore connecting with this part of yourself that is infinite, this part of you that's an eternal child, right? And then you're getting these ideas and these things that are synergistically fitting in it makes perfect sense why that's happening. Now, again, there could be endless different explanations of why that's happening, but that's how I view that. And so it's very interesting you bring that up because that is one of the common things I see across many cannabis users is they're like, I just feel like I can connect with myself in ways that are really hard to otherwise. And, you know, I think the other thing too is that we live in a world that's so disconnected and so fast paced and everything's about busyness, be busy, be busy. That like, you know, it is such a um, a difference when you can connect with something that all of a sudden just puts you into the state of like you just meditated for eight hours, you know. And so, again, it's like, do we need cannabis? No. But in the modern day world, it's going to be really hard to access those states and hold them if you are also doing things like building businesses and doing all these things and dealing with like the crazy state of the world. Right. So rather than look at any of this as bad or woe is me or victim, it's like, well, what can I utilize in a healthy way to allow me to access these things in a more beneficial way? You know, and personally for me, you know, a lot of my work is getting people out of the shame and guilt they feel around connecting with a plant medicine, you know, because they've either been told by society, it's shameful. They get told by these spiritual organizations, it's shameful. But at the end of the day, like I said, there's over 10,000 years of research suggesting that cannabis has been used in every spiritual practice, just about everyone since the dawn of time. Yeah. Uh, so glad you're doing this work. I'm so, so glad. <laughs> Thanks. Let, let's get into the mastermind a little bit. And yeah. um, I'm sure we've teased a little bit of, of what it, it feels like to be a part of it, but maybe, maybe articulate some of the, the logistics, how people can get involved, what all is going to be included. Um, w- would love to hear. So, man, I'm super excited about this. Right now, we have the waitlist live. Depending on when this releases, the waitlist ends this Saturday. Um, but never fear, people. There'll be uh, ways to get in. But right now, we have a special pricing uh, that will never be seen again. It's pretty wild. You get a free 30-minute one-on-one call with me. And you also get our updated Conscious Cannabis Guide, which is a great like just start here type manual. And when you're in there, you'll have access to connect with cannabis, coach with cannabis, and grow with cannabis, which I went over. And you'll also have over 300 hours with me and the team to be able to really transform your whole relationship, yes, to cannabis, but much more importantly, to yourself. And you'll be around people that understand you. And so, yes, you will understand everything with Conscious Cannabis, but you're going to get a lot of side quests as a bonus. You know, like we have amazing stuff coming through live ceremonies with me and Christopher August doing our Breathe with Cannabis event. 
amazing people like Dr. Jason Ganzuk, Jason Picard coming through, Hamilton Souther, Mark England, all the people that have helped me and that I really respect in life, like they're going to be coming through. Um, we're going to have opportunities just to connect, change books. I mean, just all these different things, right? And so for anyone interested, head to highlyoptimized.me and hop on the wait list. And if the wait list is over, just say that you came from this podcast and I will extend the same deals so that you can take advantage of it. So yeah, oh, that's where people can find out awesome. more info on it. It's awesome. amazing. <laughs> all right, highlyoptimized.me. And of course, we will have all the the links in the in the show notes for you guys. Wow, that sounds so incredible. Is this like your magnum opus? It really is, honestly. Like it's it's great because what I was finding is that, like, you know, I have a one line in human design, which for anyone who's into human design, it's the investigator, right? So it's very I bet check has a one line. Like it's just like that kind of thing where like you'll just want to create everything. And I was starting to have such like different quests that I was like, I want to put this all together because I don't want some of my community over here, some of it over yeah. there. Like I want everyone to hang out together and get to know each other. And yeah. so this is going to be where I'm putting everything into. We're going to have special podcast episodes. And one of the best things too is we're going to have opportunities where I was talking to you guys about this, right? If you're someone who wants to be a coach, educator, guide, podcast host, etc., one of the hardest things is like, how do you start networking, right? Where do you start? So this is going to be something where if you want to hop in and go through these programs and be a part of the community, and then you want to create a business out of this, cool, leverage my network, right? Hop on podcasts, Instagram lives with me. Let me connect you to Chase and Mimi and amazing people, right? And so, you know, being able to all help each other rise our tides together yeah. is really what this is all about. And it's just so much fun, man. Like I, I have to pinch myself most days to make sure I'm not dreaming because it wasn't long ago. Like I'm literally like, Three years ago, I was working at a dispensary, three and a half maybe, working at a dispensary, coming home, watching Aubrey Marcus, thinking, wow, it'd be cool to meet that guy one day. Yeah. And now I'm friends with him and I've gone to this podcast. So I'm yeah. telling you guys, like, they, if you believe in yourself, anything is possible. And if you have people around you that will call you forward and not allow you to play small, you will get there so much faster. And I am living proof because you can ask Rachel or anyone that's known me for a long time. I had my fair share of stories and limiting beliefs and victim mentality. And I just was able to shed all that because I dedicated myself to myself. I chose to believe in myself. And I also decided to surround myself with individuals who also believed those things. And so life can be whatever you want it to be, but make sure that you're choosing what your life, what your life will look like. Because if you're not choosing it consciously, someone else is choosing it for you. And the people that are willing to choose what your life is for you, oftentimes, most of the time do not have your best interest at heart. So this is our, you know, real answer to a lot of the different challenges that society is facing. Lack of connection, unconscious cannabis use, unconscious living, right? right? Lack of community, all these things, right? And so for anyone there, we joke often, we have the most fun homework on the internet too. It's super fun. Come hang out with us. It's awesome. <laughs> I love that. Snaps for Ryan. And that was just yes. a total mic drop. Um, curious <laughs> about the the structure. Is it like a, a membership that's a, okay, you're signing on for like a year long membership or is it a monthly membership? Tell us about the structure. Yeah, that's a great question. So it's a year long container. You can obviously choose to re sign up after, but you know, we we have a certain standard of what we want our students to be completing because we don't want to take your money if you're not doing anything. So if someone goes through a year and they don't look at anything, but they want to sign up again, we're going to be like, no, you got to actually look at this stuff, right? Because we don't want people to waste money or think they need mentors or coaches or all these things when they're not actually utilizing them. And so what it looks like is when you sign up, you'll have access to a year in the community, which will give you access to connect with cannabis coach with cannabis and grow with cannabis. And the way that the weekly calls work is there's going to be six calls every single week starting June 12th, right? So you have the invitation to hop on all of these calls if you want. Some of them are going to be the same call just at different times because we have people all over the world that join. So there's going to be ceremony integration calls. So when you're going through Connect with Cannabis, you come to those calls to receive integration coaching from me. You got this awareness to come out. Now you want to figure out what to do with it. I'm going to make sure that I hold you accountable to whatever came out that it's leading over into your everyday sober state of reality. Cause it's really important that you understand that, right? That like cannabis can show you the what, but it's up to us to figure out the how. And it's, it helps a lot if we have other people cheering us on. So those are the ceremony integration calls. I'm also going to have office hour calls because again, there's just a lot of things that come up when people are going through this work. So you're going to be able to connect with me there. We're going to have times with Alex, my business partner, where you dive into morning and nighttime ritual practice with the group, right? So you can practice breath work, yoga, and all different sorts of things with him. 
the guest presenters, of course, and then practice, right? Like that you're going to be able to do. So you're going to be able to show up once you've gone through Connect with Cannabis and graduated that. And now you're in Coach with Cannabis. You'll be able to trade off your skills on other students, ask questions. And so by the time you leave, you've facilitated, you've educated, you've coached, you've gone through all the programs, you have a supportive community. And you've also, from Mike Gonzalez and my buddy Jason, learned how to market, learned how to build a business. And there's very special offers coming out. I was just talking to Mike about how you can actually get your own business up and running for a very little cost in terms of marketing, these kind of things and understanding like, hey, don't use certain hashtags, just certain things that are relevant to when you're working with plant medicines. But yeah, it's a yearly membership. You have access to everything. There's no hidden fees. Everything is included. Wow. And that's the stitch of it. I mean, it's, you know, it's really like, when people see the pricing of it, they're going to think there's some catch. That's why I always add that. But it's our answer to if we want to anchor in Shambhala on earth, right? This this beautiful energy of heaven on earth, it's going to take a lot of people. It's going to take a village, right? And so, you know, our idea is if we can get a million people connecting with cannabis consciously, right? Not just because they're connecting with cannabis consciously, but because what that means about their entire life then we can do our part to anchor in Shambhala to earth. And it's going to be up to everyone that joins the mastermind because it's not going to be, I mean, there'd be crazy if a million people join this over the next 10 years, but it's going to be up to us. Not everyone's going to want to go full deep dive into this, right? But luckily this stuff is simple, right? Like you can just teach someone how to create an intention, a couple of words, and they're going to be able to totally change their experience with the plant. And so yeah. it's up to all of us that join the mastermind, hear these podcasts, et cetera, to pass it along to the next person, right? And so by doing that, we can all play a part in this beautiful mission to really live out a real-time movie of Return of the Jedi, right? <laughs> Where even though it looks like the powers that be are going to win, you know, love always wins, right? And so being able to do that with a group, it's fucking awesome, you know? Mm. So yeah, that's, that's what it looks like. <laughs> I love it. And I love how lit up you are talking about about yeah. it. it's, it's that's the that's the medicine that we have as people to offer our world is is engaging and and searching out seeking out a labor of love that when we talk about it we are as lit up as Ryan Sprague talking yeah, about this definitely. it's it's like that's the that's the bar that i'm going for <laughs> it's like yes. am i on ryan sprague level <laughs> okay i'm good <laughs> well you guys i mean like you know you guys are so inspiring and this is like perfect example right this is happening in living color like seeing you guys create your products be who you are have the medicine podcast which is like really what we're talking about it's the same thing we're talking about here like when you surround yourselves with people like Chase and Mimi guys, things happen because they're not going to allow you to play small, right? And when you're around a community like that, everyone, we're all magicians, right? And so we all have certain things that we can do that no one else that has ever lived or will ever live will be able to do in the same way we can do. And so the more of us that can get together, not only can we inspire each other, but we can also, it's like a docking station, right? Like as we're going out into the world and facing adversity, challenges, et cetera, when we can connect with people that get us and we can just laugh with each other and give ourselves that wink, you know, it's like that allows us to be able to really be that battery charging docking station, you yeah. know, and that's why I love that battery charger thing, because it's really like the bat signals being sent out, <laughs> right? Like it's time for return of the Jedi and let's yeah. go. We all have the ability to do this in a way that none of us talking can do the same way someone else can, you know, and that's yeah. why it's so important to inspire people to go do this because all of our magic is necessary to create this change in the world. Yeah. So mm -hmm. hell yeah, man. Hell so yeah. And you're, you're hitting on all of Chase's buttons. Star Wars, <laughs> Batman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> talking about, Eternal child. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. You start talking about Michael Jordan, it's over. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. This has been so great, man. Um, what, you know, where else can can people find you? Ryan's a fantastic social media follow, um, as is uh, Dr. Jason, who's been mentioned uh, multiple mm. times. Uh, fantastic social media follow. Uh, but where else can people find you? You mentioned the website. Um, you know, what else can people check out? Yeah, perfect. So if you want to join the waitlist, highlyoptimized.me. If you want to chat with me, hop on to Instagram at the real Ryan Sprague, S P R A G U E. If you guys can't tell, I kind of like talking. So feel free to reach out with anything. I love this stuff. It's why I do it. So reach out with any questions. I'm happy to offer any support. Um, if you want to keep up with the podcasts, we are actually going to be, we're doing a lot of changes. We're actually revamping and putting both the podcasts into one. So the highly optimized podcast is coming back soon. But right now it is all under this one time on psychedelics, that podcast. You can check those out. If you want to connect with the business profile at highly.optimized, we do all the podcast releases on there. So reach out, guys. There's plenty of ways to play. And uh, and I'm excited to chat with all of you. Mm. 
Love it. Oh, we love you so much, Ryan. Yeah. Love you guys I, I too. Wish, Thanks for we, charging my battery. I wish <laughs> that we could hang out with you more in person because you're you're definitely uh, a charging to our our batteries. Yeah, we've got an East Coast yes. trip uh, on the to do list. We'd love to get out and see you and see your tribe and and go up and see Jason as well. And so we've got a lot of a yeah. lot of fun yeah, things yeah, to do. Yeah. And, and so we'll we'll make sure to uh, stay in touch on that. Absolutely. Come on out. Water's warm. It actually kind of is because we're in the Atlantic, not the Pacific. And right. even though the Pacific is so tempting, every time I touch it, I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. The Atlantic, I actually went in the other day. And I was like, wow, this is really warm. So come on out, guys. Water's warm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Ryan, for thank blessing you us with your wisdom, your passion, and your knowledge. Your expertise is unmatched. Uh, oh, there is no you. one in the world that knows more about this space the spirituality, the science, everything to do with cannabis. You are one of one and we are so blessed to know you as a cannabis professional, but also just as a friend. We love you so much. Oh, thank you guys. I love you so much too. And I'm really excited for the next time we get to share space in person. Uh, you can't keep me away from San Diego too long. So it's yeah. not a question yeah. of if, it's just when. <laughs> <laughs> love it. We can't wait. Thank you so much for hanging with us, you guys. Check the show notes for all the applicable links. They will be there for you. Check out what Ryan has to offer. This is truly like nothing else out there. We love you. Go spread some light. Okay, bye. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed that, check out right over here for some more fun clips. Oh, and you're going to want to subscribe. Bye.